scientific approach to knowledge. A scientific approach is empirical, and that's a word that means it's based on observation and experiment. This is different than philosophy. Philosophers sit around and think about stuff, which is good. We need philosophers. They think about stuff, they argue, right? Scientists think as well, but it's tied to observation. We, we see things happening, we make an observation, and then we have an idea about that, and we do an experiment to test it. So the scientific method is a process by which we can understand nature by observing it, observing its behavior, and then conducting experiments to see if we were right or not. Key characteristics include observation, the formulation of hypotheses. Um, you can think of these sort of as an educated guess. Based on what I've observed, I think this is what's going on. Experimentation. And after those go around in a circle for a while, we get the formulation of laws and theories. And we're going to talk about all of these things. Um, the scientific method is not a rigid do this, do this, do this, do this. It's more of a general approach to uh, figuring something out. So observation, also known as data. Okay? Um, and, and whenever possible, we like to have quantifiable data. Uh, we recently had some illnesses in our house. And, okay, well, Tommy feels warm. Well, I think he has a fever, right? There's an observation. The scientist wants to know, well, how high is the fever? So let's take the temperature and, and write that down, make an observation. Observations are descriptions about the characteristics or behavior of nature. So your book uses this example. A scientist uh, back in the 1700s, Antoine Lavoisier, noticed that there was no change in the total mass of material within a container during combustion. That's just, I, I need to add some more details there. So what this guy did is he took things uh, like a piece of wood and burned them inside of a sealed up container. Now what happens to the mass, the weight of a log, if you burn it in the fireplace? After it's done burning, what happens? Well, it stays in the same place, but does it weigh as much as it did before? No, it weighs less. So some of it seems to have disappeared. We said, well, you know, we're so, we're so used to that that we're like, well, that, that's what happens when something burns up. But what happened to that stuff? So Antoine Lavoisier was investigating things like this. So he would burn things in a sealed up container. He'd weigh the container. He'd burn the thing that's inside of it. He'd weigh the container again. Nothing could get out the mass of the container was exactly the same after it had burned up. That's not what we observe when a container is open and you burn something. So an observation like that leads to a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a tentative interpretation or explanation of the observations. The observation is just, this happened. The hypothesis is, I think that this is what's going on. This is why it happened. And a good hypothesis needs to be falsifiable. You should be able to test it and see if it's true or not. So he explained, Lavoisier did, his observations of combustion by hypothesizing that when a substance burns, it combines with a component of air. So in his container, there was maybe this little chunk of wood, and there was air. And afterwards, the chunk of wood has been reduced to ash, and yet the whole thing still weighs the same. So he thought, well, I think that wood being burned is combining with something in the air. And so that was his hypothesis. The hypothesis needs to be tested. And so we do an experiment. Experiments are highly controlled procedures designed to generate observations. 
And this is one of the reasons I like chemistry more than biology. The problem with biology, and no, no offense against any of you who are biology majors, we need those. Um, living organisms are much harder to control. Non-living organisms are much easier to control. And this is one of the problems with medical research. Humans are the worst kind of biological creature to control, right? So you can't control all the variables, and that makes uh, doing experiments very difficult. In chemistry, we don't really have that problem, and so you can control everything and see what happens. The results of your experiment may support your hypothesis. Say, well, yeah, I, you know, it appears that this is correct, or it may prove it wrong. If your hypothesis is proved wrong by experiment, that does not mean you're a failure. That's just more information. Then you either need to modify the hypothesis or throw it out entirely and come up with a new one. And this is the process that scientists use to gain knowledge about, um, about matter. It also works for problem solving in everyday life. Um, let's see, next slide. So a scientific law, there are laws and there are theories, and there are trains, the endless trains. A scientific law is a brief statement, okay, I'm going to have to shut the door. A scientific law is a brief statement that summarizes past observations, predicts future ones. So an example with Lavoisier, um, the law that resulted from his experiments is known as the law of conservation of mass. In a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. This does not explain how it happens or why it happens, it just says what happens. Another law you may be familiar with is the law of gravity. So here's a pen. What does the law of gravity predict will happen when I let go of this pen? It'll fall. It does that every single semester. The pen falls. Law of gravity. Does it, the law of gravity explain why the pen fell? No. In fact, scientists are still not entirely sure what gravity is. But we can describe it, and the law of gravity predicts what will happen. Um, state laws, you know, there's laws about how fast you can drive on the freeway. You can choose to violate the state law, and many people do. You cannot choose to violate a scientific law. You can't just say, well, I'm not obeying the law of gravity today. You can't do it. Scientific laws are always true, and you can't just disregard them. A theory. One or more well-established hypotheses may form the basis for a scientific theory. The theory is explaining what happens. So we talked about Lavoisier burning wood in closed containers. John Dalton um, lived a little bit later than Lavoisier, but I think they overlapped a little bit. His atomic theory explains the law of conservation of mass. And it does so by proposing that matter is composed of small, indestructible particles called atoms. And this theory was a huge leap for understanding matter. So basically what this is saying is that, okay, the wood in that container that was burned is composed of atoms, composed of little tiny Lego bricks. And the air that is in that container is also composed of little tiny at atoms, little tiny Lego bricks. And what happens when you burn the wood is that you take apart the structure that was the wood, and you combine it with some of the pieces in the air, and now some of it's gas and some of it's solid, but all those particles are still in the container. They've just been rearranged. 
And so they weigh the same because you have the same number of Lego bricks, they've just been rearranged. And that's the idea um, that matter is composed of small indestructible particles. It explains that um, law. So scientific theory is a model for the way nature is. Tries to explain not just what it does, but why. Theories are validated by experiments. We can never conclusively prove anything to be true in science. And that can be kind of a disturbing idea. I can't prove something to be true. I can prove things to be false. The things that we accept as true are ones that no one has come up with anything that proves them to be false. So as far as we know, it's true. But future developments may lead us to revise that theory or throw it out entirely. And that has happened repeatedly in science as technology advances and we understand more. We realize that some of those earlier theories weren't quite right. But they do, exp they do provide a general explanation of the characteristics and behavior of nature. And they can be used to predict future observations. And that's where they become very, very useful. In everyday life, we use the word theory as almost, a, almost in the sense of a hypothesis. Oh, well, that's just a theory, right? You kind of blow it off. Oh, that's just a theory. In science, a theory is a serious thing. It is something that has been tested over and over by many different people in different parts of the world. Everybody's coming up with the same result. This appears to be true. So a theory in chemistry, in, in any science, is very significant. Because chemists, um, scientists in general, are very skeptical by nature. And someone publishes a paper and says, if you do this, this happens. And we say, hmm. Well, it did that for you. I wonder if it'll do that for me. I'm going to try that and see if you're wrong. And so other people will try it. And sometimes they do prove the original experimenter wrong. But it gets validated over and over. We never do, we never do anything with just one person's word or experiments to back it up. So this is kind of um, an overview of the scientific method. A well-established theory is as close to truth as we can get in science. Um, and I just want to remind you that science is not a strict set of rules that automatically leads to a concrete answer. So it's not like math, where 2 plus 2 equals 4 every single time. Um, you have rules of addition and subtraction, and they apply, and, and things work out great. Science is a little messier than that. So this flow chart can be helpful. You make an observation. You see something you think is interesting, and then you have a hypothesis based on that. The hypothesis is then tested by experiment. It may be confirmed, or you may have to revise your hypothesis. And this little part here, we sometimes it feels like you're spinning your wheels or hitting your head against a brick wall. But sometimes you have to go around and around and around and around until you get your hypothesis revised. Once the hypothesis is, um, is well established, it becomes a theory. But theories are not just left alone. They are also continually tested and revised. Observations can also lead to a law, the law of gravity. You know, that was discovered or observed a long time ago. The classic story is Newton sitting under an apple tree and an apple fell on his head. Uh, I don't think that's actually how it happened. But it's the observation. Laws are also tested by experiment and confirmed or revised over and over and over again. So it's a general framework for how we approach learning. Any questions? I like to go through some of the little um, questions and problems that are in, within your textbook. Uh, I don't usually do the conceptual connections, but since this one has no problems, we're going to do this one. So which statement best explains the difference between a law and a theory? A, a law is truth, whereas a theory is a mere speculation. 
B, a law summarizes a series of related observations while a theory gives the underlying reasons for them. Or C, a theory describes what nature does, a law describes why nature does it. Which is the correct answer? B. So B is the correct answer. The law says what happens, the theory gives the reasons why. <clears throat> 